Welcome back to our meeting uh, toward a future of environmental health sciences. Uh, I'm Patrick McMullen, and I am charged with giving a, a recap of some of the, the, the topics that we discussed yesterday. Uh, I wanted to give a, uh, an overview of, of, of what was discussed, but uh, also, also spend a little bit of time talking about kind of the larger vision of what we're, what we're trying to do here. So the, as, you, as you've heard already, this is, this is a part of a, a broader effort uh, by, by the Standing Committee and by the National Institutes of Environmental Health more broadly. Uh, to, uh, to do a little bit of strategic planning uh, in, in, uh, in, in imagining what the future might, might look like in environmental health sciences. Uh, we, we... You don't have me? Oh, I'm sorry, sorry about that. Uh, I was reading what's written on the slide. What is the future of a research enterprise that fully integrates environmental health science, biomedical science, prevention science, and disease-specific research, and is conducted across the continuum of, of fundamental research uh, through, through uh, applications to the research uh, to public health? So we, we, we've touched on a, a lot of uh, topics adjacent to this, and uh, I just wanted to, to, to capture that. Uh, a, a big piece of this is the, you know, looking about, looking at what this might look like, you know, 10, 10 years from now, what the, this research enterprise that fully integrates these, these, uh, these, these topics would look like. But then uh, our, our charge also is to think about kind of what are the steps that, uh, that it would take to get there. So uh, I, I, I would challenge us to, and I think we've done a great job of this so far, but to really take the, take the restraints off uh, to, uh, to identify uh, you know, what we want things to look like, and then what, uh, what barriers do we have to break to get there? So to the, in, in that regard, uh, and uh, Kristen mentioned this earlier this morning, uh, we, we certainly invite uh, your, your input. We have a very simple questionnaire uh, on the, uh, if you're watching in the, in the web browser, scroll up about half the screen, you'll see the link to uh, a questionnaire where, where you can, uh, uh, where you can make your make your make your input heard, and uh, we will integrate it into the discussion later today, uh, and then also in, in follow-up activities that we have now. So back to the, uh, the, the 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 material that was discussed yesterday, we we started started the day with uh, with a with a group that that really set the stage and, and painted painted a picture for us uh, of what I see as as the two key themes that have emerged uh, over, over the course of this meeting. Uh, and those are the, the need to embrace systems level thinking uh, and to address the, the complexity of, of understanding environmental health outcomes. Uh, the, one, one of the keys there is, are, are the, the socioeconomic factors that are the major determinants of, of, of health outcomes. So we heard from uh, uh, a number of our, our speakers in the, in the morning. Uh, uh, so, some great examples of this uh, in, in highlighting the opportunities and the challenges that we have ahead of us for integrating a, a broader picture of what environmental health means. So uh, Dr. Malecki uh, highlighted an example of uh, uh, in, the, in the lower left here of, of a map county by county census block by census block of the uh, of, of life expectancy as a, as a function of geography. And I think it's uh, uh, there, there are some clear uh, uh, spatial uh, correlations uh, here. Uh, uh, Dr. Geller highlighted, uh, and this is the, uh, on, the, on, the, on the right here, uh, an example of uh, how mortality risk, uh, when, when you stratify by race, uh, revealed that Black Americans are, are, are at, at three times, uh, three times higher, higher risk uh, to, uh, for, for mortality uh, resulting from exposure to uh, uh, PM 2.5 exposures. So, I, you know, I think that these, these, these are the kind of examples that really uh, kind of bring out what the, the magnitude of our, of, our, of our challenges and, and also the opportunity of, um, of what we have ahead of us. So uh, in, in, in that regard, Dr. Dr. Nikki Sheets did a great job of, of, of describing uh, uh, cumulative impact scores. Uh, uh, again, another example, those, uh, those also uh, increase uh, as, as, as a function of, uh, of, uh, of, of communities that are, uh, have, have high, uh, high percentage of minority uh, and, and high, uh, high poverty levels. Uh, 
And uh, that the second theme that, that really came out of this was that, that environmental health uh, uh, is integrative uh, and that the science needs to reflect the fact that, uh, that environmental health is integrative. So we have a, a history, uh, especially in, uh, in, in fields like toxicology of taking a very reductionist approach, looking chemical by chemical, uh, and attacking problems in isolation. And, uh, you know, I think that, that uh, the, the, the talk by Dr. Sheets uh, really did a great job of, of highlighting where that isn't effective and how, uh, in a lot of cases, it, it, uh, it disproportionately uh, impacts uh, uh, vulnerable communities uh, that, uh, that, that are, are being uh, deluged by, by, by a variety of stressors, both the, in the traditional sense in terms of chemicals uh, in the environment and also uh, socioeconomic factors that, uh, that uh, uh, we, we've heard over the past day uh, and, and a half uh, also are major determinants of, uh, of environmental health outcomes. So I, I think uh, Dr. Marvel also did a, did a great job of highlighting uh, uh, how, how, uh, how climate change and, and, and evolution of climate change has uh, uh, has uh, has 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 brought about uh, a situation where uh, environmental health disparities and uh, environmental health determinants are not uh, are not uh, directly uh, uh, accessible by a chemical by chemical approach, and uh, and uh, uh, and we need to take a more kind of holistic view of uh, of the uh, of the situation, so uh, not not that everything is uh, doom and, doom and gloom in that regard. Uh, Dr. Sheets shared a, a success story uh, where uh, uh, he and others in in, in New Jersey uh, have uh, been able to uh, impact uh, uh, legislation and and rulemaking around uh, citing citing of uh, of industrial uh, uh, operations and, and and other other uh, other facilities that uh, would lead to an increased cumulative burden of, uh, of stressors. Um, and uh, I also wanted to highlight Dr. Sheets' plea that um, you know, there's a lot of work to do here scientifically, but there's a lot that we already know uh, and we need, to, uh, we need to capitalize on that. We need to, we need to, uh, we need to act now on, on things that we can do uh, and not wait till we have all the information to, to, to take action. <clears throat> So, so following these, these stage setting talks, uh, we, we had a series of, of dialogues um, that uh, were, were kind of an extended, uh, uh, extended panel discussion. We brought in uh, experts that, that covered uh, the, the, the field that the, that the scenarios were built around and also kind of a, a adjacent fields to get a, get a, try to build a diverse perspective of what are the factors that, uh, that we need to consider uh, to build a environmental health science enterprise that uh, can effectively uh, 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 attack some of these, these, these major pressing uh, problems that we, that we have in society today. So the first was a dialogue uh, on environmental health and, and precision medicine. The, uh, the, the dialogue was, uh, was, uh, was uh, included panelists, uh, Julia Brody, Brandon Pierce, Elena Rios and Alicia Zhao. Uh, and, and there was some great discussion here about the, the evolution of precision medicine and, um, and, and, and kind of thinking of that as, 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 a, as an example of a field where, uh, where we have uh, applications today that uh, it's a field that integrates complex data um, and we're able to do things that uh, we weren't able to do uh, 10 years ago. So, so in my mind, this, this provides maybe a, a bit of a template for how we would, uh, how we would integrate some of these more, uh, more, 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 more complicated uh, uh, disciplines and, 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 and data, data types and uh, decision frameworks into environmental health sciences. Um, and there was, there was some great discussion about uh, the challenges and the uh, uh, the uh, and how those were addressed in, in precision medicine. So uh, uh, one one of these these challenges that that is, is still an issue that uh, received a, a lot of discussion is, is representation in, for instance, the clinical space. Uh, Alina Rios uh, mentioned that you know less than less than one percent of trial uh, uh, study trial participants are Hispanic. Less than five percent are, are are black. Uh, this this certainly does not represent uh, demography in in the U.S. 
um, and and what what and what what are the kinds of uh, uh, challenges that have have led us to that place, and what are the possible uh, paths forward for, uh, for for overcoming that, both in precision medicine and. Uh, um, uh, and, and more broadly in environmental health sciences. So a lot of discussion about how communication can help, uh, communication between researchers and clinicians. So uh, for instance, there, uh, there's, some, there's clarity about uh, the relationship between, for instance, an exposure and a, and a, and a, and a health, health outcome. Uh, and then also uh, uh, communication between clinicians and patients. And uh, the, the need to, uh, to make sure that we're, we're educating uh, educating patients and providing genetic counseling and other other resources to to under uh, 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 relationship between uh, 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 gene status and, and cancer risk uh, was highlighted as a as as an example, um, and the the analogy was made that I thought was uh, was was very uh, impactful that uh, that we we have taken in environmental health sciences a, a kind of uh, 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 monochemical by by monochemical approach. Uh, where, 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 where what we really need is a transition, uh, much like happened in genetics over the past 10 years, to, from an under, to an understanding that uh, uh, that uh, environmental health outcomes are the the integration of of a number of factors, not uh, not just a response to a single a single chemical. Uh, and you know, there's there's obviously challenges there, but uh, Dr. Zhao highlighted. Uh, uh, data, advances in data integration as a as a, a powerful tool for helping to uh, to to integrate uh, those aspects uh, and and you know mentioned that that wasn't something that we had in our toolbox uh, uh, when we were when we were facing these same problems with uh, with genetics. Uh, dialogue uh, uh, number two uh, was was focused on the intersection of uh, the exposomics and environmental justice. There were uh, uh, some uh, some 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 great uh, participants in this discussion. Some of the, the the most impactful leaders at the intersection of those two fields. Communication once again uh, uh, emerged as a theme. Uh, Dr. Wilson discussed the need to increase trust in science and, and scientific literacy, uh, and the need to build relationships across communities and uh, and between communities and, and decision makers. So this is this is something that uh, came up again in the in the third session. And uh, you know I think that there's there's a lot of opportunity. For for us to explore further by supporting uh, supporting those kinds of relationships uh, institutionally, uh, both you know through 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 academic channels and through funding mechanisms. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Dickerson highlighted the uh, the, the, the need that uh, uh, we need we need to uh, to, to ensure uh, a, a strong strong communication as well uh, and and build trust in um, in those relationships. Um, there, there was also a great discussion. Uh, Bob Wright and uh, Amy Soda uh, uh, talked a lot, uh, and this, this is a, a theme that, that that came up again and again. How we how we develop communication that is that is effective. Um, you know, communication uh, in terms of uh, in terms of in terms of social, uh, in terms of traditional uh, uh, print media. Um, you know, it's, it's evolved a lot over the last ten years. There are incentives for researchers to publish uh, scientific papers. Uh, those scientific papers probably have very little impact on uh, direct impact on community. So, how do we bridge that gap? I think is 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 an open uh, open question. And how do we incentivize uh, better better engagement, better communication between our uh, uh, the folks on the front lines doing the research and the the, 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 the folks in the communities that actually need to uh, need to understand what's what's being done. Session uh, session three uh, was a dialogue on the uh, the intersection uh, between uh, climate climate change and health, uh, um, and the uh, the major the, one of the major themes there is how how we can be more uh, proactive instead of reactive. Uh, what are the actions we can take to, to minimize climate change? 
how do we how do we triage decision making if uh, if for instance we have money coming in at the federal level how do we decide what goes where you know in a way that is uh, that is uh, uh, sensitive to uh, 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 social and environmental disparities across the country, uh, and and uh, how do we how do we take into into uh, into a, uh, into account uh, some of the some of the economic uh, considerations that would need to be uh, be captured there. So uh, the. the Stepping back a little bit, some of the themes, I, I would say the biggest, the biggest thing that's come out of this for me so far is the need to embrace complexity uh, and uh, in, in the way we're thinking about uh, intersectionality between compounds, between health outcomes, uh, be, between social, uh, social factors and what, what we traditionally think of as, uh, as, as uh, toxicological effects. Um, the need to reset the definition of environmental health to better reflect, for instance, cumulative impacts, uh, uh, integration across uh, hazard uh, 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 vectors, uh, both conventional and, and the less, less traditionally acknowledged, uh, i.e. The, the social determinants of health. Uh, and to, to include a more kind of cook in a, a more a community centric approach uh, with a more direct acknowledgement of, uh, of environmental justice. So uh, I, I've, I've talked a lot about kind of moving from, from theory to oper operational, operationalization. I think that's a, a major question mark of how, uh, how, we, how we make that, make some of these, these, these big concepts happen over the next 10 years. And I hope that's something we'll continue to discuss in the meeting. Uh, and then also, as I mentioned, resetting our attitudes on communication, uh, training and, and funding as we move forward. So I think that's my time to uh, to, to summarize the the topics from yesterday, and uh, uh, with that, I will yield the floor to uh, to uh, Dr. Christina Park from the National Institutes of Health, who will uh, will be guiding you through uh, session number five. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick, for that nice summary of day one. So hello everyone, welcome to the final session of this workshop. My name is Christina Park and I'll be moderating this session. I'm a program officer for the Environmental Influences and Child Health Outcomes Program, referred to as ECHO, uh, which is administered from the Office of the Director NIH. In this final session titled, New Voices and New Collaborations, the speakers will explore how, how to reach desired futures of a research enterprise that fully integrates environmental health science into broader studies of human health and how this can be accomplished through building new collaborations and sectors. In yesterday's session and this morning, as you heard from Patrick, uh, we heard a lot about the need for multidisciplinary collaborative efforts and for engaging communities in the research, particularly um, those that had been marginalized and disadvantaged. So this session will be truly exciting as, as the We'll have eight to 10 minutes of talk, uh, followed by the 20 minute panel discussion. I'd like to remind all the audience members um, to submit your questions below the video player and those will be addressed during the discussion time. The first speaker is Dr. Jamaji Wanaji Anwarim. Uh, Dr. Wanaji Anwarim is an emergency medicine resident physician and adjunct assistant professor of environmental health at Emory University School of Medicine and Emory Rollins School of Public Health. He is an emerging leader uh, in health, having received numerous recognition and fellowships already, including the Agents of Change in Environmental Justice Fellowship. So um, Jamaji, please take it away. In his 2011 State of the Union speech, former President Obama stated that the future is ours to win. But to get there, we cannot stand still. As we reflect on the future of environmental health, those words from over a decade ago remain so relevant. We can't just stand still. So important is that specific word, still. 
I emphasize still because it doesn't just mean simply doing nothing. It also means not evolving. To win a healthier future for all of us, we really must constantly re-examine and improve all that we do. In the next few minutes, I hope to offer you five important considerations for moving forward with environmental health biomarkers. Markers that we currently use in research, but hope to one day use in the medical management of patients. First, frame of time matters. We oftentimes think about this when defining exposures. For instance, long-term exposure to metals or short-term exposure to BOCs. But this happens less often when speaking about environmental health biomarkers. But this matters. Imagine that I'm managing a patient with a severe infection. There are a range of different measures that I might rely on. I may elect to measure their vital signs every 30 minutes, but just because they no longer have a fever or just because they no longer have a fast heart rate does not mean that their infection has subsided. Vital signs can fluctuate in a matter of seconds or minutes. For this reason, I'm also likely to measure leukocytes as well as lactic acid every six or so hours. And that's because leukocytes and lactic acid give me longer term information about this patient's status. As we propose new environmental health markers, we must always remember how fast or how slow we expect our markers of interest to evolve. Which brings us to our second consideration, objective. What is our end goal for the biomarker? When a young person is suspected of having dangerous lead exposures, we can measure lead in them and manage them with medicines such as a chelating agent. However, their management doesn't stop there. With further investigations, we work to identify where those harmful exposures came from. And then we attempt to remove those exposures. Novel biomarkers are exciting because they offer the prospect of being able to identify harmful exposures before the development of symptoms. That's right, before people even know that they are sick. This could be absolutely revolutionary when it comes to smoldering exposures. However, we must remember that the objective is still the same. Manage the patient in the healthcare environment and then work to mitigate exposures outside of the hospital. I will add that many of the markers that we study now are associated with a number of different exposures. So maintaining an exposomic perspective will be of the utmost importance. Our third point is risk. Often biomarkers are framed from the perspective of personal or individual risk. However, for fine particles in the air, and for many of the exposures that we study and hope to act on, the individuals most affected oftentimes can do very little to personally mitigate their exposures. It's often impossible for a person to stop working in a certain area or to move from the area where they live. As such, these markers could be an immense resource for population health advocacy. Healthcare bodies in various areas that are highly impacted 
can be important partners for helping to organize any interventions aimed at making meaningful impacts. Population risk goes hand in hand with considerations of health equity. In previous National Academies workshops, we've discussed important steps to ensure that biomarkers work for everyone. For instance, we've recommended that biomarker development happen with diverse populations and with diverse research staff. Also important is the language used to describe risks. Risk should not be falsely assigned to social constructs like race. Lastly, it is undeniable that there are a number of remaining steps before many of the leading markers that we study can be applied to medical management. However, we should not allow our lack of understanding of these markers to delay our assessments of marker usefulness. Both things can be done side by side. Till this day, we recognize that amyloid beta and tau peptides are features of Alzheimer's dementia. However, we still do not fully understand the mechanisms that link these markers to dementia pathology. In summary, when performing environmental health biomarker research or considering any, any interventions that may use these markers, the root mnemonic, risk, objective, usefulness or utility versus understanding, time frame, and equity can be useful for helping us to make comprehensive assessments of our work. The future really is ours to win, but to get there, we can't just stand still. With the root framework, that path onwards is hopefully more apparent. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Tamaji. That was great. Um, so we'll move on to the next speaker, who is Dr. Martin uh, Merleville. He is the co-founder and a partner in Safe for May, which is a mission-driven venture capital fund investing in companies and technologies that reduce human exposure to harmful chemicals. So he'll bring interesting industry perspectives to this session. Marty? Excellent. Thank you for the invitation to be here today. Um, I feel a little out of place, but honored to share what I see as some of the developments in the future of safer chemistry. The chemical industry, as you all know, has certainly had a, a large impact on environmental health and the health of both humans and the resilience of ecosystems. And so I wanna talk about the paths forward for the industry and some of the ways that the environmental health community and the chemistry communities can work more closely together to ensure we get to an end state, which is what I think we're all looking for, safer chemicals and safer products for all of us to bring into our home. So as we look forward to the future of chemistry, there are two distinct paths um, because we are already shifting the way that we produce chemistry. So as the petrochemical industry stops producing as many of its products for fuels, they have made large investments in the plastics infrastructure and in the specialty chemical infrastructure. These investments are happening in real time. You can find an, a number of reports from United Nations Environmental uh, Working Group from the uh, IEA that point to the large investments. These are hundreds of millions and billions of dollars that are being put to, instead of turning our, our petrochemicals and fossil resources into fuels, turning them into plastics um, and other chemicals. One could throw up their arms and say, 
that, that this is a hopeless situation. I see this situation as an opportunity to shift production. And that's important because if there's an opportunity to shift production, if investments are being made, we can influence what the future of chemistry looks like. I hope the future of chemistry looks more like green chemistry. I used to run the UC Berkeley Center for Green Chemistry at UC Berkeley. And this is, is some of the framework that we would teach our students. That green chemistry is chemistry that protects human health and the environment. And so how do you do that? You avoid known chemical classes of concern. And I'm gonna come back to this, this idea of classes a few times. So things like PFAS, bisphenols, phthalates, heavy metals, things that you've all talked about already. Um, avoiding those classes, designing chemicals that are optimized for their end of use. And one thing that's relatively easy is designing chemicals that are less persistent in the environment. Um, and finally, in, in investing in and in designing chemicals that are better for climate resilience. And when I say that, these are chemicals that don't harm not only human health, but environmental health, because the resilience of our ecosystems are clearly essential for, for all of us to change, uh, to adapt to a changing climate. So what does this mean practically for the, the future of chemistry? One off-sited alternative to petrochemical resources are bio-based chemicals. And so we need to ask the question, will bio-based chemicals get us to the future of chemistry that we're looking for? And of course, as has been pointed out, the, the reality is much more complex than we'd like. So you don't need to worry about these chemical structures, but this is, this is how a chemist thinks, right? These are building blocks of either bio-based chemical resources on the left or petrochemical resources on the right. I wanna be clear that it's not that one of these is great and the other is evil. It's that they actually look fundamentally different to the eyes of a chemist. The chemicals on the right have a much higher uh, carbon to heteroatom or oxygen ratio than the chemicals on the left. This is often what we see. These fossil resources are the, the carbon that hasn't broke down over the previous millions of years. And the tools that chemistry, the, the chemical industry has developed have focused on ways of adding complexity to these molecules. If you're gonna start with the molecules on the left, we actually are focusing now on reducing the complexity of the feedstock to get to things that are useful within the industry. And I put these up um, to show why we need to engage a, a, a range of disciplines in the discussion of what we want the future of chemistry to look like. I think we want to avoid persistence and we certainly want to avoid um, harmful health outcomes, but we need to understand how those health outcomes are related to these molecular structures. If we're ever gonna communicate across the disciplines of environmental health, toxicology, which is often the bridge to chemistry. So the first thing is, what does the future of bio-based chemistry look like? The next and related theme is how about bioplastics? One of the things that we see a lot of um, these days is a shift from petrochemicals to bioplastics or bio-based resources. And it, one of the, the reasons why I bring this up, and this is again, something that we always talk about in our classes at Berkeley, is the importance of definitions. As we define what we want the future to look like, if we want it to be safer, more renewable and more resilient, we need to understand what these terms mean. And so I put this chart up because it, it shows how even the term bioplastics has been used to mean a number of different things to different stakeholders. Sometimes bioplastics are the same as their petrochemical alternatives at a molecular level, but are being derived from uh, renewable resources. The examples of sugarcane, uh, polyethylene, PET, are, are common and actually higher volume production chemicals than bio-based chemicals that are actually new, like PLA, PHA, PBS, or, or starch blend. Um, and the other important thing is not to confuse where carbon comes from with where it'll end up in the environment. So just because something is 
comes from a renewable resource doesn't mean that it'll be benign or break down quickly in the environment. And in fact, you can also use fossil based building blocks to make chemicals that will break down in the environment or in a, a managed facility like a compost facility. Right now, when you look at, at the store shelves, it's the wild west in terms of claims when it comes to bio-based and uh, renewable chemistry. Um, this may be a little far afield from traditional environmental health, but the importance of understanding and influencing the definition of these terms will change what the future generations of chemicals look like. The other thing that I like to point out is that any product that's based in, in materials and chemistry is made of usually a base material. So this is your polymer, your fiber, your plastic, your metal. These are the drivers of environmental impacts. Our environmental resilience is, is dependent on making sure the production of these base materials is done in as uh, safe and sustainable a way as possible. The health impacts, on the other hand, are actually often driven not by the base materials, not by the choice of plastic versus paper, but by the additive chemistries, which are often smaller volume and often harder to identify in our products that are added to make these base materials functional. For example, the perfluorinated chemicals often used in the paper industry to make uh, paperboard or, pl or papers more grease and oil resistant. Those are the drivers of harm, not the underlying uh, cellulose. Similarly, phthalates that are added to plastic resins as plasticizers, smaller volume, but higher impact on human health and the environment. In order for the environmental health world to effectively uh, think about these challenges, the first thing that is needed is transparency. So the ability to not only tell what base material a product is made out of, but what all of the additives that go into it all. So all of this takes me to the importance of the class approach. And so I know that you've spent a while talking about the importance of considering mixtures as well as individual chemicals and the need to shift away from the focus on individual chemicals and toxicology and environmental health to the impact of mixtures. I would add to that the importance of focusing on classes. And classes aren't just chemical classes like bisphenols or perfluorinated alkyl substances. They're also based on endpoints. So grouping chemicals that are all persistent based on structure, or there are all endocrine disruptors. We also spend a lot of time grouping chemicals based on function. So when we think about driving towards safer chemicals, it's important to understand what uh, a chemical of concern was doing in the first place. So adhesives, polymers, dyes, these are also relevant classes. And so rather than getting stuck on the definition of the right chemical classes, I encourage everyone to think about how do we use a class approach? How do we take the, the intellectual investment we've made in understanding a given set of chemicals or circumstances into understanding the broader context. What other things could be informed by the, the research that we do? How can we make groups of chemicals, groups of actions come together? Because I find that as a chemist trying to design chemistries, the more I can understand how a group acts, the better I can avoid, better I can do to avoid regrettable substitution in the end. So if you take nothing else from this, this talk, it would be my advocacy for taking a class approach to chemical design, to environmental health, and certainly to toxicology, and increasingly, hopefully, to public policy. I'd like to thank you for uh, inviting me to participate in this, and I, I welcome the discussion that will come afterwards. I think it's very important that folks in environmental health, chemistry, and toxicology all work together to ensure that as we change production, we do get to the future we want, which is safer and more sustainable. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Mulville. Um, 
we just had two very interesting talks uh, delving slightly deeper into the biomarker, uh, the framework, and then the chemi chemistry. So next, um, let's turn to our next speaker, who is Dr. Chandra Jackson. She is an Earl Stedman investigator in the epidemiology branch of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences with a joint appointment in the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities. Uh, she has received numerous awards for her work, uh, which includes uh, lately the research on physical and social environmental factors that impact health disparities. Chandra? Thank you. Hello, everyone. I hope you all are doing well. This presentation reflecting my personal uh, current perspective is entitled Rediscovery Science, Learning from the Past to Move Towards an Action-Oriented Future of Decision-Making in Unison with the Ecosystem. I want to start at the most macro level possible in keeping with the idea of first principles thinking in order to reverse engineer complicated problems. And so I'm sure we can all agree that um, we're collectively a part of the cosmos or this vast universe where we believe all space, matter, and energy are contained. And we happen to be in one particular galaxy. And within the galaxy, we're a part of a solar system bound by the gravitational pull of the sun, which supports all life. And it's because of uh, the rotation of the earth on its axis that we all have circadian rhythms that regulate biological processes impacting every cell, tissue and organ in the body. And the main circadian clock is actually housed in the suprachiasmatic nucleus of the brain's hypothalamus. And it happens to sit on top of the human spinal cord, which carries nerve or electrical signals throughout the human body. And misalignment of these circadian rhythms can influence a wide range of diseases. Also, these brain waves from an electroencephalogram are a depiction of the electrical activity essentially generated from the universe, since it's where a, a group of neurons send electrochemical signals to another group of neurons. So this essentially demonstrates that we are a part of and not separate from what we call the environment. So it's imperative that we operate like we're a mere manifestation of the environment and govern our behaviors based off of the laws of nature that reflect our interconnectedness and like our fates are tied together. And I think a prime example is climate change disproportionately affecting socially disadvantaged groups uh, living in the least desirable conditions, but um, we know that climate change is ultimately threatening all human existence. So again, we're interconnected. And so acknowledging and behaving based off of this interconnectedness would then ideally lead to no longer exploiting the land since it would be considered self-destructive or counterproductive. Um, after all, over the course of this workshop, we've nicely delineated the complex, widespread environmental, including social challenges we're facing. But um, it can be simplified by acknowledging that avoidable um, exploitation is at the core. For instance, humans are uh, causing soil depletion through intensive farming practices that have amplified food production, but also deforestation. Um, there's scaled up farming practices um, that have led to the Industrial Revolution, which contributes to air, light, and noise pollution, landfills filling up in heat islands, along with anthropogenic uh, unnatural chemicals being produced, all directly or indirectly contributing to uh, the type of physiological dysregulation that leads to poor health, you know, the ones we're all concerned about. And so in addition to land, we also need to stop and avoid future forms of human exploitation, like the under or uncompensated human labor used to extract resources from the land. Um, for instance, there's there's uh, been historical attempts to justify subjugation of certain groups for the gain of a few by applying arbitrary labels. And this actually created the social construct of, uh, of race that led to social stratification and subsequent social patterning of disease where outcome severity often mirrors level of disadvantage. 
But uh, in a perfect world, every human would be born with the right to individual autonomy and groups based off of social identity would be able to practice self-determination within a social contract that supports harmony or collaborative societal conditions. And this would happen without interference or a domination that restricts freedom and degrades dignity. But as a central example, um, the Constitution is America's social contract, but it was written for and by a select group of people. Um, and at a time when groups like African Americans were uh, officially considered three fifths human. And so this history surrounding a lack of equal protection under the law has clearly contributed to um, environmental injustice issues that we're currently contending with. And also the figure on the right shows a timeline of non-exhaustive laws and policies that have systematically excluded or stripped sovereignty from populations identifying as Black um, and Indigenous. Um, and so this contributes to the differential exposure uh, burden uh, to adverse environments. And so ultimately, these are the types of social ills that lead to recalcitrant health inequities. And to me, the only effective solution is to uh, stop these uh, exploitative exclusionary practices, which is uh, what health equity is calling for by defining it as the assurance of the conditions needed for optimal health among all people, regardless of social group membership. And so the directive is even to value all individuals and populations equally, recognize and rectify historical injustices, and provide resources according to need. So not just equally, but according to need. And so uh, when thinking about the role of research, we need to address the limiting hyper-focus on illuminating biological mechanisms. Um, which is inefficient to me, at least, because context is invariably uh, important for all research questions when we're interested in translating findings to benefit uh, the health of humans. And so uh, this is evidenced by institutions like uh, NIEHS being interested in identifying how physical environments impact health while also broadening the definition of environment to include social circumstances, which um, makes up what we've already established as the social and environmental determinants of health, uh, considered the main drivers of health inequities. And uh, these drivers are influenced by fundamental causes, including social conditions like structural racism, which, in, uh, which uh, includes policies and practices that uh, influence variation in health and disease. And so therefore, as shown on the left of the slide, we need to dedicate resources to the collection and integration of data on exposures along the entire spectrum of translational research. And this could inform primordial or primary prevention and not just secondary and tertiary like has been the case in the past. And so I believe, uh, actually that most resources should be allocated to research that prevents risk factors from uh, even developing. And, uh, but to get there, we'll need to understand that we currently have an over-reliance on intellect or logic, which can't fully capture the effects of environmental influences uh, well beyond our inherently limited uh, perception. Uh, so imagine trying to capture the essence of the cosmos, which we're a part of. Um, and for example, we're in hot pursuit of solutions and focusing on, uh, on leveraging technology in an attempt to capture life and integrate exposures at all of these various levels, including the ecosystem. It's a valiant effort, but uh, more impressive technology won't um, be the actual solution. Uh, for example, uh, two consequences of exploitation include preventable illnesses and hunger and attempted solutions so far in using uh, just human logic have included pharmaceutical drugs and operations for illnesses. Um, and in terms of hunger, pesticides, fertilizers, processed foods, genetically modified organisms, um, and all of these have side effects, including 
including artificial intelligence, where we are already identifying biased algorithms. Um, and so technology used to understand the impact of environmental exposures on health won't automatically address the fundamental issue of land and human exploitation, which we've already identified as leading to climate change and even health inequities. And so I do, however, think that we can direct the use of uh, technologies to disrupt these exploit exploitative practices. Um, through efforts like using the tools to help with more citizen science type of efforts that can be scaled at the um, from the local to the national and global level, but also tools can be used, for instance, like multi omics uh, that open up what was previously a a black box in order to support efforts surrounding litigation to stop unfair practices, but also legislation and including regulation. Um, and so in closing, I recommend a rediscovery science approach for uh, the future of environmental health, which involves not just thinking and depending on logic, which is inherently limited, but having uh, our care for fellow humans reflected in our actions, not just conversations, uh, meaning scientists across the research spectrum from all disciplines can focus on efforts that actually disrupt exploitative practices. And so clearly the challenge would be accomplishing this in a capitalistic society where companies are now merely pretending to go green for more profits. And so um, nonetheless, we've established the urgency of addressing climate change and uh, taking on environmental justice issues. And it's clear that they're interconnected since equity involves assuring the conditions needed for optimal health among all people, regardless of social group membership. And so the solutions are obvious. We need clean air and water, optimal soil and food security, and to get people at at least the baseline standard of uh, housing conditions, for instance. So building a roadmap to achieve these outcomes uh, should be the focus, in my humble opinion. And uh, instead of digging into the analytical complexities of now, we can pivot and focus on creating the world we want, essentially pleasantness within and around us which I think is a noteworthy um, uh, barometer of success. And uh, it makes sense to prioritize the most impactful solutions or system changes to get back aligned with the laws of nature and sustainable living. Uh, in fact, we could incentivize transdisciplinary scholars and stakeholders from all sectors of society, since we all um, have a stake, uh, we can incentivize them to be involved in efforts to, for instance, reduce emissions, incredibly important, <laughs> uh, increase tree farming on a large scale to address uh, desertification or soil depletion, and then also um, employ these uh, transdisciplinary scholars and stakeholders to uh, heal the humans who have been disproportionately harmed. Like even now, there are farmers in India committing suicide at alarming rates. So um, I hope there's a sense of urgency that will push us towards action. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chandra. Uh, that was a very um, comprehensive and thought provoking um, presentation. So let's now move to our final speaker, who is Dr. Kim Fortune. Uh, she's a professor and department chair in the University of California, Irvine's Department of Anthropology. Her research and teaching focus on environmental risk and disaster, uh, including examining how people in different geographic and organizational contexts understand environmental problems and environmental health risks. So Dr. Fortune. Hello, and thank you for the introduction and to all the conference organizers for bringing us together. This has been an impressive and encouraging um, set of sessions over the last two days. I've titled my um, presentation, Environmental Health and Justice 2030, trying to look towards 
where we're going, but with awareness that we'll be needing to work in many directions at once. I share that I borrow my title from a campaign um, underway by the Louisiana Center for Health Equity, LA 40 by 230. And in this campaign, they're working in many directions to bring Louisiana from 49th on the list of health status in the United States to 40 by 2030. Louisiana includes uh, what is well known as um, Cancer Alley between Baton Rouge and New Orleans, where I've done some of my research. The state is complex and so and, and expansive. And so imagining what it will take to help Louisiana Center for Health Equity realize their goal, mobilizing the kind of expertise we have here, I find incredibly challenging and motivating. And part of what I think I can share with this group is that I'm a field researcher. So I have many of the problems described across the days I've kind of watched unfold at the community level. I began my research in the 90s at the site of Union Carbide's pesticide plant disaster in Bhopal, India. I wasn't there in the immediate aftermath of the disaster, but in the years that it was uh, being heard in the courts in both the United States and, uh, and India. And so what I, I, I came to want to understand is how do people in different fields of expertise and organizations see the problems were, were before us? How do they characterize them and how does that delimit how they can be addressed? Um, on the upper right, you see a very crude information board used to uh, look for survivors of the, of the, gas, of the gas tragedy. And this, this image has really haunted me uh, throughout my career, leading me to ask what kind of knowledge infrastructure do we need to scaffold prevention of the kinds of disasters that happened in Bhopal and response to ongoing disasters <laughs> going forward. So Bhopal, my work in Bhopal launched a career of field studies in many settings around the world and across the U.S. focused on what I think of as three kinds of disasters, fast, rapid onset acute, which mobilizes a, a certain kind of response, a very different kind of response is mobilized and called for with more routine slow disaster. And what I teach my students as combination disaster, which is when you have extreme weather militarization around the world that is just exacerbating and driving the kinds of risk in the other systems uh, productive of environmental harms. And I'll argue that combo disaster is um, at this point way beyond the coordinational capacities of our educational programs, our government agencies, uh, and so on. And so it's something for us to, to, to consider going forward. I wanna focus on four things that I've learned through these field studies that I think are particularly relevant for the discussions here. The first is that I want to emphasize that the people do not know. There is still um, profoundly insufficient understanding of environmental health hazards and harms in the public sphere. And I'll point to two examples of that. I teach a very large class focused on environmental injustice at a University of California campus that is Hispanic serving. We have many first generation students. Many of my students come from very toxic communities across California far too many of them come into my classroom completely unfamiliar with the hazards that are in their home communities. A second example on the right is a extraordinarily creative and dynamic community organizer, Leonel Flores in the Southern California city of Santa Ana. Um, his he works for a community organization that has worked for the betterment of the community for 30 years. Just three years ago, did they, as he puts it, learn they were an environmental justice community. And a line that he puts in front of his community all the time is that an environmental justice keeps getting bigger every day. So communities on the ground are trying to get their heads around the cumulative risks that we've talked about so much. Um, but it's a, um, for many, there's, um, it's work out ahead of them. 
And I think there's a couple ways that we can um, address uh, the lack of um, or, or build knowledge capacity in the public sphere. One, this is an example of work associated with the Metal Sub Superfund Research Center at the University of New Mexico, where they have worked with um, uh, artist Mallory Koitaki from Zuni Pueblo to do incredibly <laughs> creative science communication using the aesthetics forms from the communities um, impacted. And I, I wanna point, use this slide to point to the need for many kinds of communication. Another example I'll give is that in recent, very strong investigative journalism by um, ProPublica, uh, they knew that many of the, the communities most impacted by their findings, very beautifully displayed um, data visualizations of air burdens, um, that they wouldn't, that the communities most impacted wouldn't be reading their journalism. So they had a side-by-side -side postcard campaign that took, um, took their findings kind of to the household level through a different, very different mode of communication. So this kind of expansive and creative communications outreach will be critical. I also want to, to emphasize the importance of K through 12 education. This hasn't come up much in the last few days, but we need to backward engineer environmental health knowledge in across our educational system. And I, I think that the, the talks earlier uh, this afternoon emphasize it's not just going to be more STEM as usual. We're gonna have to think very quick critically about the kind of content that will grow up our youngest students today into sophisticated environmental health actors tomorrow. Uh, my second point is that community-based organizations uh, can be impressively capable. Um, these are two community organizers I've um, watched and worked alongside for many years, Diane Wilson working on the Texas Gulf Coast and Willa Subra uh, working in Louisiana. And with this slide, I want to point to the extraordinary data curation that these activists have um, ended up assuming responsibility for. And so one thing I wanna to point to is the way we can scaffold or build knowledge infrastructure for communities to give them the capabilities that we know that they need. Um, a couple um, ways that I think we can do this in the, in the presentations yesterday, um, Patrick Kinney mentioned the um, pioneering effort by Ken Olden at NIEHS in the 1990s to build, to, to enroll community-based organizations in scientific research through funding mechanisms. And he pointed to the incredible enduring effects of that visible in the strength of an EJ organization like We Act, West Harlem Environmental Action in New York. And so I think that there are ways to build community capacity for the long term. The other thing that was um, happening in the 90s that I don't see happening now is communities affected by similar problems. The classes of problems that we heard about in the previous talk um, aren't connected to each other. And so there's so much learning that could happen <laughs> across communities, whether they're dealing with hydrofluoric acid or ethylene oxide, you know, to build connected communities as part of the knowledge infrastructure. And with this image on this slide, this is a uh, work that my own research group is doing to help build knowledge, uh, digital infrastructure for communities using the kind of uh, virtual research environments that we have available on our university campuses to infrastructure community knowledge. My third point will be quick is that we, there is so much important and good work done by our government agencies, but it does largely remain atomized. And I know this is not um, new insight, but I see it every day in the communities that I work in. And in many ways, agencies are mission delimited in a way that's very paralyzing. So you really do have a, as the many community people's um, speak, it's like <laughs> problems are just kicked down the road. It's always some other agency's problem. Um, and an example brought up in a talk yesterday was that if you want to prevent exposures, you need to pre uh, prevent permitting, for example. And that's a mix of 
um, uh, local and state government, but federal can have kind of a community's back if it's not happening. So really imagining the multiple scales at which governance needs to be happen, happen and be interconnected. So with this image, I want to suggest the kind of really interconnected dynamic shared governance that we need to create going forward. And last, I'll speak about scientists themselves. In the almost 30 uh, years that I've been focusing on environmental justice, I have been so impressed and appreciative by what the environmental health sciences become, have become. Not only has the science been incredibly impressive, but the willingness of environmental health scientists to reach beyond what they're used to doing to try and make their research relevant in the world. At the same time, I think we can think about what makes it hard for environmental health scientists to kind of move in ways that they imagine. And on the left, I'll have an image which is almost a, um, a classic image of the hyper-focused uh, research scientist. Um, the ideal of focus and elegance being how all of us are socialized to think of good work. And sometimes that's at odds with paying attention to the environs around and the kind of complex um, problems that communities are facing. So on the right is my colleague, Don Blake, um, a really wonderful um, air chemist at UCI. And um, I'm working with him, partnering with the community on a beyond the tailpipe studies. So they're trying to uh, capture gases coming off uh, the brakes that you're seeing in this. But what Don was willing to do in the last couple of months was follow the community's lead where we're working in. And he's done canister sampling along in, in, in places around this industrial corridor. So just like government agencies need to be responsive to problems, even if they seem kind of outside their mandate, I think we need to really license scientists and fund them to be able to be responsive beyond a given project that's funded and on schedule, et cetera. There's ways that we can scaffold their work. I wanna end by um, returning to a kind of more um, global statement, asking you to look with me at this set of images that I always use to launch a PhD seminar I teach in research design, um, because I think the lessons are relevant across disciplines. And what I ask is, what are you seeing here as a set? Um, as Martin said, what do you see? You know, is this a class that we're looking at? Um, and I can, over the years, I've gotten very imaginative um, narrations of what we're looking at. But what I then ask students to look at is what they see when they know that all of these images came from this, this children's book it's called Alphabet City and Al City by Numbers. And what I want them to see is that once they know that's where these images came from, that is all you see. All you can see, all that becomes figure in this landscape are the ABCs. And I point to this lesson because in the urgency to translate environmental health research to practical outcomes, we need to not forget to constantly unsettle how we're thinking about the problem, what we see as the problem, what we see as solutions. And so the need for dy dynamic interconnection between the most basic ex experimental, unsettled approach to the problems and translation and action. Uh, we can't let one go uh, without the other. So I'll just end by suggesting that uh, we, the kind of call for translation that has been such a theme in the presentations here, um, I want us all to invest in. And I also want us to invest scaffold the kind of knowledge that we're going to need for problems that we really can't yet can't yet imagine that will be um, before us in a decade or two or three. So thank you. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Dr. Fortune, for that enlightening talk. Um, and I want to thank all the excellent speakers. Uh, you brought such uh, diverse disciplines and perspectives to this session. I think this session was all the more um, interesting, very, very interesting. 
Um, so at this time, I want to remind our um, audience members that if you have any questions that you want to um, ask the panelists, please enter your questions uh, um, in the box below the video player. Um, so why, why don't I start with all the panelists? Um, so you've heard each other's talks and I'm sure a lot of thoughts have crossed your minds as you know, all the, the, the um, presentations were so different from one another. So as you listen to the, the um, speakers, what are your thoughts on, um, yeah, what are the new collaboration, collaborative efforts that we need to engage in? Um, you know, so can we start with, let's see, Jamaji, your impressions of the session and what do you think are the, the major, um, you know, things that we need to start collaborating on or just, just in general? I think one of, the, one of the elements that stands out the most to me is the whole idea of reimagining how we educate mm. ourselves as a whole, um, whether that's from starting with people in medical schools or in professional schools, but all the way back to those who are in third grade, fourth, fifth, right? Um, we see this not only from an environmental health standpoint, but from health as a, as a whole. I have patients who have fevers and they come in and they just tell me, you know, I took Benadryl, which is an antihistamine, which has really no role for infections. Um, so there's a huge gap in just the way that we as a society have taught health. And I think if we don't focus on that and fixing that, many of the problems that we see now um, are really here to stay. Okay, Marty, your thoughts? Yeah, um, I was struck by uh, a theme or at least one of the themes I think I heard is that there is no amount of measurement that's going to get us to the one right answer. There's no amount of reductionism and uh, evaluation that's going to get everyone onto the same page. And so if that's the truth, the question back to us becomes, all right, how in the absence of certainty do we make uh, steps in the right direction. And I think that's the challenge that, that we all face, regardless of where we, we sit. And so I, I'm inspired by the idea that, you know, in something as, as messy and complicated as environmental health, we still know enough today to take steps in the right direction. And mm -hmm. I think that's, that's what we need to challenge ourselves to do is take those steps, even if they're not certain. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, very good point. Thank you. Um, Chandra? Sure, I can't agree more that we certainly need to challenge ourselves to uh, take action, especially given the urgency of uh, of some matters uh, in terms of climate change. And I'm particularly, as somebody who's highly collaborative, I can see many combinations of potential uh, effective partnerships. But I do think we're in environmental health really starting to respect the power in um, community involvement in research because that will aid in the translation of our scientific findings into um, action that actually improves uh, the health of the populations um, who are paying tax dollars uh, for us to conduct this research. So I really think uh, a focus on the most pressing matters, I can imagine um, collaborations between farmers and stakeholders with the finances uh, in order to uh, support, again, the uh, tree farming efforts in order to uh, address um, the adverse impacts that we're having on, on the environment. But also uh, communities uh, being empowered in order to uh, work with policymakers to make decisions 
that do improve improve their immediate surroundings because that is well-being. Again, pleasantness within you and pleasantness around you. And so I think um, that understanding can drive decisions that lead to uh, action. Um, and I think we all have a role to play. So again, there are many different combinations of potential collaborations. So that's what uh, made me excited. And that's potentially why the talks were so diverse. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. Kim? Thank you. I want to um, build from what Jamaji said and that to argue that an important form of collaboration that we need to um, mobilize is that health scientists need to be shrill, ardent um, advocates of deeper investments in our educational system. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not, um, it's ironic that in the last 30 years with the incredible growth of capacity in the environmental health sciences, we've actually defunded our public schools. And like, we can't see these as separate anymore. Um, and also acknowledging that the communities that are most vulnerable, one of the indicators is educational attainment. So we can't have community capacity if we don't educate our third graders, which means putting more teachers in the classroom. I mean, we've got incredibly committed teachers that we need to better support. The other part of that, which calls for even more investment, is all of this happens within a very oily information sphere. There are industrial interests scrambling the airwaves, making it harder to understand the problems we deal with, what causes them, how to fix them. And so there's a, we need to understand that it's not, it's a very fraught space that will be doing this, which will require even a um, redoubled effort to use education as a mechanism of change. So Kim, um, in follow up to what you were just saying, do you, um, I mean, can you offer some solutions to, um, for uh, the public and even the scientists to be able to, um, you know, make our way better with in this a lot of information search and not knowing what is, you know, truth and what is not and, what are the really important things that we need to grasp and you know push forward? I mean, do you have any suggestions or solutions how we can deal with this problem, communication problem or the information problem? It's it's complicated, but I do think that what could be called kind of divisible knowledge, you know, some someone knows the epidemiology and someone else knows the green chemistry. It sets us up for a tit for tat where industry is claiming this doesn't hurt you and mm -hmm. someone else is saying, yes, it does. But I think if we better coordinate and integrate knowledge, that there will be a stronger base to stand from responding to uh, the disinformation um, and also being ready for that, having the kind of infrastructure where, you know, when you know, when, when the industri industry association in Louisiana insists that, you know, Cancer Alley is a misnomer, um, you know, we need to be able to respond tomorrow. And, you know, scientists like the ones on this call need to be um, available to have the backs of communities pushing back against that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Chandra, think, did you have something to say? Or Marty, go ahead. I say it also comes to we've seen a rapid shift in the availability of both information and disinformation. Um, and that means that we need to focus our education at all levels from elementary through uh, professional training, much less on sharing information and much more on information evaluation. I think most of us on this call grew up at the cusp of the availability of this information. So we still spent a lot of time becoming specialists by learning information that wasn't widely available. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have to challenge ourselves and certainly the next generation to 
not worry about getting information. Information is available and this information is available. And so it comes down to the ability to recognize and evaluate and synthesize. These are all much more important skill sets. Yeah. Um, and that we have to go to that humbly and recognize that that's a big lift and a big change in how we educate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And just to um, you know, uh, get your opinion a little further, since you are the closest to the industry, how do we engage industry partners to uh, work with other scientists together to promote environmental health? Yeah, I think this is an important recognition is the industry isn't a monolith. And so right. for any given uh, challenge, environmental health or community challenge, there will be industries that will be well aligned and supportive with the outcomes you'd like to see and industries who fi whose financial interests are uh, against the outcomes you'd like to see. And so it's not about, are you working with the industry or against the industry? You know, find the industry that is aligned with removing chemicals of concern from those communities. Um, industry too often by academics and, and uh, advocacies have been viewed as a, an evil monolith. And there's good reasons for that. There's plenty of history. I don't, not judging that, but creating change means finding uncomfortable allies. A uh, great example is like moving away from halogenated flame retardants. Who would have guessed that the polyurethane foam industry, one of the biggest users of halogenated flame retardants, would actually come to the aid of that movement away from them because they didn't want to use them. They didn't like their workers getting cancer. They didn't like the additional expense of those uh, added chemicals to their foam products. They were much more interested in alternative designs for furniture than they were for adding more uh, halogenated flame retardants. On the flip side, Albermile, who makes those halogenated flame retardants, is never going to be your ally. So don't try, don't bother, don't worry about what Albemarle has to say. Um, we have to get much smarter about who our industry allies and eh, potential adversaries are. And they might change from, from you know, issue to issue. There is no good industry or bad industry. There's just, they all have their, their interests and they're actually easier to figure out than some other people's interests. Yeah. Chandra, did you have something to say? or? Regarding the question. Oh, no, I was agreeing with this comment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so how, so we talked about some infrastructure to bring collaborators and, um, and initiate, you know, dialogue amongst different players. Who should be taking on the sort of leadership role in you know, creating that infrastructure and bringing all the players together. Any thoughts on that? As I mentioned the reference yesterday to Ken Olden's um, initiative at NIHS to use basically the design of call for proposals as a way to require. And at mm -hmm. first I think, there was probably a lot of complaints about being required to do something. So you have to have patience to, mm -hmm. to watch it be realized. The other thing I'll note is that certainly for academics, and I expect it's the same for intramural scientists, um, there's real um, discounting of organizational work of this kind. And I think of it as academic organizing. It's like, you know, we know we need labor organizing. Do you think you create good knowledge without like creative organizational effort? And so the kind of treatment of it as service rather than real work is just a big problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And we talked a lot throughout the workshop about engage in communities and, you know, especially those communities and, uh, you know, people that are, have been marginalized and disadvantaged. And a lot of this um, environmental health research, uh, we also recognize that we need to integrate even, you know, even beyond disciplines, but 
integration across local government, state, and national. Um, so how, how, any thoughts on how that can be, uh, that, that will facilitate such integration across all different forms of um, governments and other organizations? I think integration in the abstract is always hard That's, and painful, yeah. but integration in the concrete, uh -huh. is, it's, it's easier to find the people who have interests and ability. And so, you know, this is what I find in, in chemical substitution too, like it, getting rid of bad actor X is really hard, but getting a, rid of bad actor X in a particular function may actually be possible because now we can talk about what an alternative looks like. Whereas we can't talk about it in the abstract. And your question was more related to uh, coordination across government agencies and other things, but it's similarly, mm -hmm. like what does climate regulation look like across those things? And if we you know, make it more narrow and say, this is a focus on, on climate, then you know who belongs at the table. If you're just organizing, everyone feels like it's additional work. It's, mm -hmm. it's back to that, that problem. Yeah. It's service and, and not core to your, what you're doing. And, and that's mm -hmm. not where integration belongs. Yeah, yeah. Thank and, you. And, and then once you create the core set of individuals who would address a particular issue, you clearly find the tentacles or where you can connect with an, a different set of uh, core stakeholders around another particular uh, issue in order to um, sort of address the fact that we are everything is sort of interconnected. And so you can find ways to um, identify overlap in order to make any one effort potentially more uh, impactful. So um, I agree that it's complicated, but there are ways to operationalize how we become more effective and expansive. Yeah, thank you. Um, and just to share, um, you know, my own experience and the example of the ECHO program, uh, we try to have this collaborative science because ECHO is a longitudinal cohort study of on children's health outcomes, but it is it leverages existing cohorts. We have over, I think, about 70 different cohorts that had been conducted, the, the studies had been conducted in the past. So we pulled these cohorts together and leveraged their extant data as well as moving forward and following up these participants from the existing studies. So from the get-go, um, you know, the initial period of the study, we decided to use the team science principles and every time uh, the scientists got together, we went over some of the principles of team science and on how to work together, uh, you know, how to communicate better, how to have the, you know, go for the same vision. And I think it really paid off this conscious effort to educate one another and um, to abide by the, the collaborative principles really helped us to, um, do a much better job at working together. Um, so yeah, I do agree that collaboration in absent in abstract is really difficult. But when you uh, have some framework and some principles that you educate one another and agree to work together, um, it really helps um, to do collaborative science. So I think we're almost approaching the top of the hour. Any last word? Um... The last thing that I will add is that, you know, one thing that's really unique is that every November we vote, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a power in that. So if we can educate people to really feel as though these issues matter and they express that whenever they vote for their next leaders, whether that be on a local, state or federal level, that's mm -hmm. one way to also help usher in a lot of these things that we're speaking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good point. I'll note or just remind people that I think this fall will be the 40th anniversary of the mobilization in North Carolina that launched um, the environmental justice movement in the U.S. And so to really imagine what it means to take that movement into its next phase. And there 
are really exciting developments. The Biden administration's call for environmental justice across agencies. I mean, I'm watching agencies scramble to figure out <laughs> what it means to do that. And it's going to take an all hands on deck because they mm. have not been, you know, these agencies haven't been designed. They haven't educated their people to, to characterize, much less respond to environmental injustice. So it's another opportunity to come together. It's not quite as delimited as taking one chemical out of a product, but it's like, all right, what's it look like to actually hold the Corps of Engineer, for example, responsible for environmental justice? Um, and I think that can be a real shared project. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Thank you for that information. So I just wanna thank all the speakers here. Um, thank you so much for bringing your perspectives and your background and experience. That was a, a truly uh, insightful session that we had. Um, so now I'm gonna uh, hand it over to Kristin Malecki, I believe. Yes, thank you. Thank you so, so much for that incredibly, incredibly rich discussion. So now I have the, um, honor and privilege and unique challenge of summarizing this, um, these rich discussions that we've been having over the last two days. And um, so I want to start with this fundamental question that we, that we brought to bear in, in generating this workshop over time. So first of all, before I begin, um, I will acknowledge everyone again, but I just wanna thank this um, last panel of speakers that we have. Um, it's a group of scientists looking to the future. They're on the cutting edge of the work that they do. And as you heard from the rich discussion, they have some incredible ideas about how we move forward in addressing the challenges that we face in environmental health sciences today. So thank you to that group. And thank you, Christina, for, for moderating that session. So again, going back to where we started in this workshop, the fundamental question we asked is what is the future of a research enterprise that fully integrates environmental health science, biomedical science, prevention research, and dis disease specific research, and is conducted across the continuum from fundamental discovery research through applications of the research to population health. And really what we wanted to do was um, start with looking towards the future. Where do we want to be in 10 years? And then again, thinking about if we have this future in mind, how do we, what is it, what is it that we need to accomplish over the next 10 years to achieve that future? So some of the questions that we posed to the, to the audience and we've been grappling with um, in a really rich and, and dynamic way over the last two days is what is a site, what are the societal or health challenges that environmental health sciences can address into the future? What are the research topics that we should be prioritizing and addressing in the next five to, year, to 10 years? And what are the barriers from scientific understanding, tools, and technology? And so these were the initial questions, but I think as we move forward, one of the major themes that came out of the work that we've talked about over the last two days is that we really need more complex models and integration of knowledge and information to advance environmental health sciences. And as a field, um, we really need to be embracing this complexity in both acknowledging a critical life course perspective to the work that we do, really integrating and considering the social determinants of health that we have, addressing cumulative impacts, cumulative risk, identifying not only the negative impacts, but what are the assets and resources that support resilience in communities, particularly in communities that are um, most often underserved. And what we just heard in the last session, we also can really look to new opportunities for new biomarkers of exposure and response. We can think about our bio-based chemistry and predictive toxicology. All of these new innovative strategies can help to drive, solve some of these solutions. So how are we going to get there? Um, we need integration of knowledge across disciplines, integration of knowledge across platforms, and integration of knowledge from communities. And I think this really should say local to global, but understanding that we live in a global world, but many of the solutions, many of the challenges and how we're gonna achieve these complex goals can be driven at a local community level because context really matters in the work that we do. In terms of what are our priorities and what are the themes that, that um, 
both the audience as well as those speaking today have identified with respect to environmental health. It's both the health impacts of climate change, but also its deep connection with environmental justice. So climate change is closely linked to one health, ecosystems, landscapes, and sustainable living. And oftentimes some of the, the, the most impactful solutions to our climate change challenges are local. And I think one these, these are very parallel, both from environmental justice, and we heard this time and again, that some of the solutions to climate change, such as reducing factory emissions in a local community, have the co-benefits of not only um, reducing the cumulative impacts and the cumulative burden on underserved and under undervalued communities, but also to helping support climate change. So we need to look towards these complex solutions that have these co-benefits. We need to really focus on empowering communities and building capacity to give community-based programs um, a voice in our research efforts. And then we need um, comprehensive multi-scale regulations that again, to address this integrated and interconnectedness. Um, we also need multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, and collaborative teams. On the left, I have the voices of all of the different scientists that we heard over the last day and a half addressing the complexity of environmental health sciences and the need for this dynamic interaction and working directly with building communities, citizens, underserved, overburdened voices into the science that we do. And the science that we do should be dri driven by these voices and we need to build strong, trusted, long-lasting partnerships. And we can do this through coalition building. We can also do this through decision, bringing collaborative teams together, bringing decision makers and practitioners together to the table with these environmental health scientists and supporting public and private partnerships moving forward. Um, we need to, we learned, talked a lot about advancing the utility of innovation in environmental health sciences. So we heard a lot about where the future of innovation will be. We know that technology is advancing rapidly, but we need to also recognize that in order to take advantage of this technology, we need to have new analytic methods that make this technology accessible, not only to scientists, but also to community members in order. So we need some new analytic methods to address this complexity. We need more longitudinal cohort and population-based studies that also embrace the use of this technology to address this complexity. We, we know that in order to advance environmental health sciences, we heard time and again that we also need to understand human exposures to better support effective action. And not only identify these broad-based exposures, but we also need these multi-omic and systems biology research to translate this into biological underpinnings of health and disease. And this can be done as we just heard in this last session with these new biomarkers and models of response. And um, a key component that both Dr. Geller mentioned um, yesterday, and we heard again today, is that these new biomarker models can be capturing um, biological effects of environmental exposures before um, before we see adverse outcomes happen. So can we be looking more upstream? And then we have new approaches and this new technology can classify chemicals. So a, a class approach, but we can, there's all sorts of this analogy that we just heard around um, understanding classes of chemicals and, and broad-based biological effects to advance environmental health sciences goes along with some other themes that we don't need to have all of the answers in place in order to take action. Another theme around how do we get there, um, we heard both from Dr. Karen Barely yesterday, and it was reiterated again by Dr. Shonda Jackson today, is that we need to have a focus on intersectionality, humanity, and healing if we're really going to move forward in advancing environmental justice. And we need to acknowledge the cumulative impacts, risk, and resilience within communities. We need to support lifting community voices. And um, as Dr. Shonda Jackson said, much better than I will be able to, to do. We need a framework that combines both logic and intelligence to address the basic needs of, um, of environmental health sciences. And I've put just a brief definition of intersectionality here because as environmental health scientists who may not be working with the social scientists, when, they talk, when we talk about intersectionality, it's that many of us um, come to the table with different identities and these identities overlap, but these identities can also lead to unique cumulative impacts. And so thinking about that is really a, a way to move forward in, in this problem-based solution approach to addressing environmental health sciences. 
Another final theme that we really heard a lot about is communication and communication science. So communication science is needed to advance awareness about environmental health. It's critical to translation, translating environmental health sciences for advancing environmental health literacy and advancing environmental justice for information evaluation. We need to be able to take communication science and all of the data and information that we have. And really, we just heard this again in the last session to recognize, evaluate and synthesize the impacts of environmental health sciences into the future. And then we really need to continue to ask these key questions are what are the communication modalities that we need to evolve to effectively recognize change in environmental health sciences. So probably acknowledging social media as one of those platforms is great, but we also need to know that not everybody is hooked in with social media, believe it or not. And so we have to think what, how does communication happen to whom and where, who are the trusted messengers and how do we get those messages out the door? Another theme that's come up again and again is that we need solution-based approaches to environmental health research and environmental health science. Again, focusing on the social determinants, translation, environmental health literacy. And finally, a theme that we heard in this very last session that I don't think we've heard much before, but I think is really critical is supporting education of health scientists and within our educational system. And this is also very related to things that we heard yesterday about the need to advance political will towards understanding the impact and importance of environmental health sciences um, in our daily lives. And fin finally, when we think about funding and funding models, we need to be a bit more creative. And we heard that again just now, but we need to provide data and resources that build in both time and money for, for these multidisciplinary and community-driven research. So one example that I heard yesterday is that maybe these funding mechanisms need one to two years of program planning and relationship building in order to then move towards three to four years of implementation science and develop that then goes into a model of sustainability and funding. We need to reduce the barriers to funding in many different ways, including um, making sure that those um, who need access to the funding can get access to the funding and that community members um, have the capacity to work with scientists to, to access the funding that can support the research that we need to do. We need to consider um, more funding that goes from science to policy. And then we also heard in our first session that these collaborations across NIH institutions, we need to hold NIH responsible for furthering a lot of the work that they've already started to advance in terms of collaborative funding models across institutions. Um, and also we need to encourage specific calls for community engagement in research and environmental health leadership. And again, we need um, partnerships to be advanced and maybe funding to support these partnerships between research and applied practice in environmental health sciences. So in summary, looking to the future in a decade and beyond, we have a need new data discovery and environment, environmental health sciences in the etiology of disease and human exposure assessment. We need to prioritize environmental justice and climate change. We need to drive our science in collaboration with our community partners. We need to embrace and address the complexity and the challenges that are ahead of us. We need to be creative in our funding. We need to advance our own and everyone else's knowledge in communication and communication science. And part of that is really preparing the next generation of scientists. And we need to reimagine how we educate not only ourselves, but politicians, the public about health and environmental health. And all of this can be fostered and facilitated through more translational and team science. So with that, I will end my summary and thank everyone um, at the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine program and staff that made this uh, workshop possible to the Standing Committee on Emerging Science for Environmental Health Decision Makers for moving in this future casting um, and participating in these future casting exercises, as well as this workshop to the organizing committee for all of their time and effort and really being thoughtful about who we bring to the table and how we organize a conference to lift the voices beyond our own standing committee to really understand where we should be moving forward in um, addressing the future of environmental health. And finally, to the panelists, the speakers and participants, you made this an incredibly, incredibly rich discussion. Um, and we really have led to some strong convergence on where environmental health sciences should be going in the future. So with that, I want to thank everyone for being here today, for spending your, your time with us today. And we are um, eternally grateful for everyone. And I think we have a wonderful roadmap to move forward. <laughs>